theyeshiva.net. Okay, so the shear was, uh, first of all, welcome everybody. Bruchim Abayim. So Beis Hashem will have three shiurim on this mimer. The first is tonight. And uh, the next one will be next Wednesday, followed by Sunday afterwards, Sunday morning. Next Wednesday, again, the same time, and then Sunday morning, 9.30 uh, a.m., Sunday before Yud Shvat. I want to thank the family of Reb Zalman Yudha Deitch, who sent the Contrasim here from New York uh, yesterday, and the sponsor the Shir, Leilu Nishmus Reb Zalman Yudha, Reb Shalom Yishaya Deitch. So we're going to learn a Maimer. Basi Lagani Tovshin Yutes. It's page Tess. Page Tess in this booklet. Also posted, source sheets are also posted on the web on the yeshiva.net. So anybody could check it up there as well. I'll just give a little background, which some of you may know, but it's, uh, perhaps some of you don't know it, and it's always good to repeat. The Rebbe Rayats. The Friedrich, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, passed away. Shabbos, Parshas, Boy, Yud, Shva, Tov, Shin, Yud. Uh, which was on a Shabbos, Shabbos morning, 10 to 8 in the morning, in his home on the second floor of 770 Eastern Parkway. Uh, during his last years, due to uh, his, uh, his, uh, his health situation, he was physically very ill. It was difficult for him to communicate verbally. So instead of saying my marim, which was the minig, the tradition of all Chabad Rebbes on Yom Tif and special days, Shabbos, to say a maim chsidis, to say a discourse in chsidis, instead he would publish, write, or take something that he has written in earlier years from a maimer of decades earlier or years earlier and publish it. That year... He also published a Maimer for Shabbos Yud Shvat, because Yud Shvat happens to be the yard site of his grandmother. His grandmother, Rebbe Tzirifka, the wife of the fourth Lubavitch Rebbe, Rebbe Maharash, passed away Yud Shvat, Tafresh Ayin Dalad, 1914. He happened to be very close to her. So in honor of her yard site, he published a Maimer that he said in the early 1920s in Russia, which began with the words, Bosi Lagani Achoy the Maimer had 20 chapters. The first five he published for Shabbos Yud Shvat, for the yard side of his Baba, people should learn. The next five chapters for the yard side of his mother, Rabbi Sitchtay Nassar, which was three days later, Yud Gimel Shvat. The next five chapters for Purim. And the last five chapters for Beis Nissen, which is the yard side of his father, the Rebbe Rashab. So that Maimer was published Friday, Erev Shabbos Ba Yud Shvat, to be learned for Yud Shvat that year, which began with the Pasuk, Basi Lagani Achai Of course, nobody realized that that day, that very Shabbos, for which he published a Maimer, was the Histalkos, the passing of the Rebbe Rayatz. So as it turned out, the Rebbe Rayatz published a Maimer, Chsidis, on the very day, for the very day of his own yard site. And then his son-in-law, who would succeed him, the Rebbe, continue to publish the rest of the Mimer, of course, all the way to Beis Nissen, the last five chapters, which made it a full Mimer of 20 chapters. The next year, the first anniversary of the yard site was Tov Shin Yud Aleph, 1951. At the Fabrengen of Yud Shvat, the whole year the Rebbe refused to assume the mantle of leadership on Chabad. At that Fabrengen, he uh, embraced it. An old Chassid from London, who was... Uh, in his high 80s, his name was Rabbi Nemtsev, he stood up on a table and he said, the sikh is an ingut. We, we appreciate your talks, but the chsidim on a maimer, which was the, something that was reserved for the Rebbe's to say. And in a few, then a, a few seconds afterwards, the Rebbe started his first maimer, which like a sign that he accepted a position as the seventh leader of the Chabad movement, succeeding his father-in-law, the Rebbe Rayatz. And... He began with the words of the Maimer of a year ago that his father-in-law published, which is Basi Lagani Achai And he focused that year on the first chapter, explaining it, elaborating on it, stopped a few times to sing the Gunim in the middle of it. The next year, again, Yud Shvat, he said the Maimer, but he focused on the second chapter, explaining it. And so each year he'd focus on another chapter. 1959, Tovshin Yud Tess was chapter 9, Tess. He finished in the year Tovshin... Uh, 
1969, he finished, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tavshin Lamed, 1970, he finished the 20 chapters. And Lamed Aleph, 71, he began the cycle again. And each year Shvat, this was the tradition of the Fabrengen, the Rebbe dedicated a nice amount of time to say a mimer, a discourse in Chesedus, based on the discourse of the Rebbe Rayatz of his father-in-law, focusing on one chapter and developing it with great depth. And the cycle continued again. It never finished a second time. The last one was Tov Shem Mem Ches. I was there in 1988 where the Rebbe did chapter 18. And that's where, that's where uh, he never, he never, it was another two years till 20, he finished Yud Ches, because after that the Rebbe didn't say my Marim and Yud Shvat. Since this year is Tov Shem Ayin Tes, right? So the cycle, as it began again, it finished again Tov Shem Nun, 1990, and then started again uh, once more. And now is the, now is, uh, I guess, uh, now is the, is the, is the, is the, is the fourth cycle fourth cycle, which began uh, 2011, Tavshin Ayin Aleph. So since this is Tavshin Ayin Tess, that's why they published for Yud Shvat this year the Mimer of Tavshin Yud Tess, 1959, and Tavshin Lamed Tess, 1979. Tavshin Yud Tess was the first cycle, Tavshin Lamed Tess is the second cycle, and the Rebbe said Maimarim both of those years focused on chapter 9. So we're going to learn Tavshin Yud Tess. It's a uh, very profound discourse, extremely it's quite complex and profound. Uh, it's long as well. It took the Rebbe 46 minutes to say it, which was, was considered a quite a long mimer because my mother was said fast and very sometimes brief and concise, and in a few minutes the Rebbe could uh, compact quite many ideas that were very profound in the world of Kabbalah and Chesidus. Okay, So let's begin. It's page test on the Kuntras. Feel free to ask any questions. No questions are off limits if you don't understand something or any other question. If anybody would like a coffee or a tea or a drink, or feel free. You don't have to be shy or self-conscious at all. There's also a of milk, I think. Oh, now you want cups also? Okay. Huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 he wants Caleb also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can't put the oil in. Yeah. The truth is, there was a Jew. He passed away a few years ago. His name was Label Zisma. He lived in the Five Towns, and he once shared with me that when he was a child, in 1938. Or 37, 37 or 38. He lived in Kovna, in Kovna, in Lithuania. And his father, uh, anybody knew Label Zisman? Uh, you remember Label Zisman? He had a father. His father was murdered, murdered by the Germans. He was in Auschwitz. So uh, his father took him to the Friedrich Rebbe, to the Rebbe Layat, to Baal Ha'ilula for, for Sukkot, for Simchas Teira. I think Tzadik Zion or Tzadik Ches. The, the, Mamash, one of the last ones before the war. Uh, the Rebbe was then in, uh, in Otvotsk. Otvotsk is a beautiful city in Poland, not far from Warsaw. It's like a very suburbia. The yeshiva was in Otvotsk. And he was there, sh- sh- and there was a fabrengen in the Rebbe Dayatz's house. And the Rebbe said to his father, Zog l'chayim. And he gave him l'chayim, vodka to say l'chayim. So he said, Rebbe, he, he was a kid, he tells me that his father turned to Rebbe, he says, Rebbe, ich will nishna de oides, ich will euch de kelem. I want not only the light, I also want the vessels. So he says, nem de keli, take the vessel. So he took it and he brought it home with him. Ich will nishna de oides, ich will euch de kelem. So there's a, a good source for it. Bossi legani achaisi kala. Shlomo Melech says in Shirashirim, chapter 5, Bosi Lagani, I came to my garden, to my sister, to my bride. This is the famous Pasuk in Shirashirim. According to Chazal, it's describing the day that the Mishkan was erected. Moshe Rabbeinu puts up the Mishkan, and Hashem, the Rebbeinu Shalom, says, At last, Bosi, I've come, Lagani, to my garden, to be together with my sister, the bride. 
Umavayer kvayt kedushas moyni v'chami. Adineinu moyni v'rabbeinu balai lula ba maimer. My father in law the Rebbe, explains. In the Maimer, the Maimer, of course, Basi Lagani of Tavshin Yud of 1950, the Iker based on what the Medrash Rabba, Shihashirim, Medrash Rabba Shihashirim, says on this Pasuk, Lagani Lignuni. Lagani means not only my garden, but Lignuni, Lignuni, which means the, the, the place where I dwell for pleasure. Lignuni is like the, a special residence for pleasure. You know, kings, noblemen would have a place. What, what do they call it? Uh, you know, the house you go to for. Uh, you remember the word for it? Vacation. Huh? Like vacation, but it's like the place where you, you dwell for delight, for pleasure. Meditation. Huh? Ligani, lignuni. That's what Gani is. No, it's not just a garden he walked in to smell flowers or to pluck fruits, but it's lignuni. Lamakim shoye ikri betchila. Why does Hashem call it Lagani? I came back to the place, my garden, my vacation home, the place where my essence was once there, was once the Iker Shechine Betachtoyne It's a fascinating medrash because the essence, the primary dwelling place of the Shechina was where Betachtoyne in the lowest places, in the lowest world. That's why he says, I didn't come to the garden. I didn't come to your home. I came to my home. I came to, what, what makes it yours? This is earth, this is not heaven. So he says, no, this used to be my place. I was expelled from here, but this used to be, this used to be my place. This used to be my place. They threw me out of here. But now I just came back to what was Gani. That's why I could call it mine. I'm not a guest here. I'm really, I'm really the resident. What's Pshat? Because the sabri in the beginning of creation, nivra. The Madrish Rabbah has an expression, the world was created in a full way, in a wholesome way. It was a beautiful, perfect world. As a result of the transgression of the tree of knowledge and subsequent sins, the Shechina was removed from below, from this world, and it was relegated to the higher realms. And so the Medrash goes through with each subsequent sin. The first expelled the Shechina from earth to the first level of heaven and the second level of heaven, all the way to the seventh. Then came Avram Avinu, and he started to heal the world. And then there were seven Tzadikim. And each Tzadik, Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Levi, Kahas, Amram. It's Avram, Mitzak, Yaakov, Levi, Kahas, Amram is number six, and Moshe is number seven. Each of these Sadikim, so to speak, brought it down one step, one level lower in the in the descent rather than the ascent. Ad the Ad Ashola Samshachayam Avram, he began. Shahu Ayaharisha. Vahiridim Riki Azayan Lavav, he brought it from seven to six Vahuli. All the way down, as I said, Avram, Mitzak, Yaakov, uh, K- Levi, Kahas, Amram, um, Achaba, Moshe, Shu, Ashvi. Moshe is number seven. The Chol, Ashvi, and Chavivin, the Medrash says elsewhere in Vayikra, all the sevenths are beloved. There's a special preciousness to the seventh, like Shabbos is number seven, and Shemitah is number seven, and Moshe is number seven. Vahiridim, Irikiah, Aleph, Lamata, Baritz. And Moshe, at last, Brings the Shekhinah, of the divine presence from heaven number one down to the earth. That's why Moshe is the one who receives the mitzvah. Make a sanctuary, and I will dwell in the sanctuary. The On the most basic level, this represents Hashem saying, I want to come back to earth. I want to dwell here in this world. After all these generations where there was an expulsion of the Divine Presence, it's time to come back. That's Basi Lagani, when the Mishkan is actually built. He says, I came back to my, my old place, the place where I used to, so to speak, hang out, the place where I spent some, some good quality time. I mean, basically a couple of hours. <laughs> Not a very long time, a couple of days maybe. <laughs> it wasn't a very long time. That's what I'm saying, Qua- quality time. Quality time. And then from the Chet Eitzadas, it was already expulsion, and Moshe brings it back. That's the Medrash. This is all the Medrash Rabbah on Shir Hashirim and the, on the Pasuk Basilegani. 
with some explanation. The sages say, he doesn't say, it should have said, in it, not in them. So the Chazal tell us on this, that it represents in each Jew. Build a mikdash and I will dwell among them, among the Jewish people. But it's the same concept coming back down to earth to be in the hearts of his people. He explains in the Maim Basi Ligani in chapter 3 the deeper mystical or spiritual explanation why the Mishkan was built pr- primarily from Atse Shittim. Atse Shittim is usually translated as cedar wood, but the Hebrew word for it is Shittim. So everything is precise in Torah. This is not Stam, you need wood, you need lumber to crush them, the pillars, the beams of the Mishkan, which is basically the structure of the Mishkan, the walls of the Mishkan were made from Atse Shittim. It's not just you need lumber, he chose Atse Shittim. The Shittim humiloshin Hatoya. The word shittim comes from the word hatoya, which means to, uh, uh, to, to, to deviate, to veer, to veer off. The Pasuk says about the man and Baloischa, shatuam, right? The nation wandered off to go gather the man. Shittim, from the word shatu, is basically to veer off from the from the straight, middle, direct path. Now, veering off can happen in two ways. One is, You could go from the ordinary to the extraordinary. In other words, far more positive. Or the other way around. You go, you deviate in crooked and destructive ways. Deviating in the negative direction is expressed in what the Gemara says in Saitad of Gimel. Rish Lakish says, The Gemara says, fascinatingly, a person does not sin unless a spirit of insanity enters into him. And that's a principle of the Gemara. It's a statement. There's no such a thing, a person doing an Aveda, unless there's a Ruach Shtus, a spirit of folly, of, of Shtus, like we say, a Shaita. Insanity. It's called uh, momentary insanity. Let's call it that way. But there has to be some insanity that sets in in order to justify a person to be able to sin. Some form of insanity. What is the word for it? Shtus. Why is shtus called shtus? Comes from the word shittim. Because insanity basically means you veer off the path of wisdom, of, of normalcy, of sanity, of responsibility, of, cons- of a path that's constructive, etc. Ushtuzeh. So it's shatu, it's shtus. It's a, that's what a shaitim. A shaitim means you can't, there's nothing predictable. You can't expect anything. He goes, you know, he, he does things on his own. And this shtus, insanity, which exists in the world. Tzarech lafeich lebchines hashtus dikdusha. One ought to transform. The reason that we have this ability is so that we should be able to have Ruach Shtus in the opposite direction. That's the reason. It's not Stam because you want to allow a person to be insane. It's the insanity that causes a person to sin that can also cause a person to grow in extraordinary ways, to take quantum leaps far beyond the ordinary. So the Shtus that is that is uh, destructive, ought to be metamorphosized into a shtus that is constructive. Where one could connect to Hashem and serve in a way that is beyond structure, beyond rationale, beyond the limits of reason. So yes, it works in both ways. And the way to deal with your shtus is not obliterate it, transform it. Realize that capacity, that capability of a person to rise above reason. And this transformation from shtus to shtus is the primary spiritual work of the Mishkan and the Beis HaMikdash. Which is how you create the Basi Lagani, 
dwelling among them, which is the Shekhinah coming back down here through Atzei Shittim. That's why you have to build it through Atzei Shittim. Atzei Shittim represents the avoid of Shtus. What type of Shtus? Shtus de Kedusha. Holy insanity. As he brings in the Maimer, in the, in the original Maim Bas a story in the Maseches Ksuvas, the Gemara tells a story that... Um, that uh, I think it was Reb Yitzchak, Reb Shmuel, Merakad Atlas. Um, he used to dance by a chasana and juggle, uh, juggle hadasim to be to bring joy to the kala and the chasan. So Reb Zayir said, "Kamichsef lon sava." The old man is embarrassing all of us because he was a great sage, and he's putting us all to shame because at a wedding, huh, like the French twins. At a wedding, at Gesprungen and getanzt and this, uh, you want to you show what he did? Uh, you can also do that So uh, So he said, the old man, he's embarrassing us of how he behaves. You know, there has to be some, you have to restra- restrain yourself. And the Gemara continues, in Masechus Ksuvas, you'd say that at his funeral, Ifsik amudu denoyre beinoy lekula alma, there was a pillar of fire that Abzeda sensed that put him into a different league. He couldn't get close spiritually. So he said, Right? And some say, uh, And some say, Three versions of what he said. The first version is, Shtuse means the shtus, the insanity helped the old man. What is he talking about? The fact that he transcended self-consciousness. He didn't live in a world only of, of structure and comfort zones that make sense. He had the ability of holy insanity. That's the transformation that the Beis Amikdash remains spiritually, the Atzei Shittim. And that creates the Basi Lagani. According to this, the Reb Rayatz explains why the Atzei Shittim, the Torah defines as Krushim. Now, Krushim means beams, pillars. The, 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 the Mishkan, the structure, the Hegel, was surrounded by pillars, and that was its structure. They're called crush and beams. Those were made from cedar wood. Atzishit. So you'll say, what, what, what do you mean why it's called crush them? Because that's the word in Hebrew for beams. What should you call it? Shulchanois, tables? They were beams. So he says, no, because Shekol Hashem is Shebetayda Heim Bidiyu Kumasimim Latoichen and Yonah. We spoke about this in the Shia yesterday, Chavdal Tevis, that in Torah, every name is not incidental. You need to name things, so you name an orange is an orange, and an apple is an apple, and a mic is a mic, and a book is a book, a table is a table. In Lashon Kodesh, a name is connected to the essence of that which carries the name, because the letters of the name are the channels of energy, of spiritual energy. So the fact that in Lashon Kodesh, in Hebrew, that's what it also means, Hashem created the world with Lashon Kodesh. In other words, the language, the holy language is connected to the very essence of the, the DNA of the universe. This is a fundamental idea. And therefore, the fact that the beams are called Krushim is not, well, you need a name, so we have Krushim. <laughs> and if you would call it, uh, if you would call it Urias, which means the tapestries that cover the Mishkan, you'll ask the opposite question. It means that there is a connection here. The Hine Ha'oisius de Keresh, Heim Oisius Sheker, Va'oisius Kesher. The word Keresh is made up of three letters Kufreshin. The same three letters make up the word sheker, which means a lie. It also makes up the word kesher, which means a bond, a unit. Who's the, the fish? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. We have in the refrigerator, don't worry. Can sit in the Mizrach. Can sit in the Mizrach. But over here you just can't fall asleep. <laughs> but just don't fall asleep here. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> he knows he could never sleep because I always bang him. Okay, so so Keresh, Keresh stands for Sheker, which means a lie, of course, but it also is Kesher, which means connection, intimacy, bonding, right, a relationship, a Kesher. You say Kesher between two people or not. Vahainu, why is this the Keresh? Because this represents the spiritual message. Because the primary avoid of a person is to take the lie of the world, 
the deceptive qualities of life and not run from it, but transform it into pillars of the Mishkan, meaning instruments of connection. Which means to align, to reconnect everything in the world with Hashem, with the Mebishten, and with with Shechina, Basi Lagani, Iker Shechina, with the Pnimius, with the core of the Ein Saif. So yes, when you live in the world, you're living in a place of of lies, of deceptions, of cover-ups. That's the nature of our life. The Medrash Rabbah says in Bereshis that when Hashem wanted to create the world, there was an argument between Emes and Chesed. Chesed said, create the world because people will do a lot of chesed. And Emes said, truth said, don't create the world. The world is based on lies. So what did Hashem do? He took Emes and he, th- he threw it away. He threw it into the ground. That's why it says, Emes merits titzmach. As they used to say, the Emes is tiff, tiff, tiff in the earth. The Emes is deep, deep, deep in the earth. It's very, very hard to find. Very hard to find. So... Uh, there was once a chassid, he once expressed himself, he said, what's the definition of death? What happens when somebody dies? What happens? There's so many different ways you can answer that question, but he gave his, he said, meher tof leigen. <laughs> That's basically what happens. <laughs> person stops lying. <laughs> that was his definition. <laughs> meher tof leigen. Yeah. There was a chassid, his name was Abaren. He was from the Tzamaq Sadi, he said, he was 90 years old. He says, I've been lying for 90 years. One day, let me not lie. It's not only, we're not talking, the fact that this world is filled with liars, that's obvious the point. But even, even, even that somebody who's trying to lie, the world is filled with, 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 with cover-ups. It's a world of cover-ups, right? The less you say, they always say, the less you say, the more safe you are. The more you say, the more dangerous it is. It's a world of diplomacy. It's a world of, 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 of politics. It's not a world where MS shines. So you can get very discouraged. Truthful people go crazy from this world. They go crazy. And the more truthful you are, the more crazy you become. And you, there's different responses. Some people fight. Some people run away. Some people get into depression. Some people become cynical. Some people stop caring. And some people start drinking <laughs> or get into other stuff to numb, to numb the pain. What the Rebbe is saying here is that that represents the void of a person. To confront a sheker, to confront their own lies and to transform it into a kesher, to transform it into a, into a relationship. Or in other words, to take the shtus, the capability of ruach shtus and to transform it into a different type of shtus, into a different type of, of connection. And as a result of that, you can build a mishkan through kroshim, which are made from atzishit. As the Maimer over there in Basilagani explains at length the nature of the letters kuf and reish and their correspondence, their parallel in holiness. In Zohar, the letters Kuf and Resh are called Asven de Ziyuf. The letters of falsehood. Ziyuf means forge, forgeries, right? Lazayuf is to forge. Like forging documents. Asven de Ziyuf are letters of falsehood. The Zohar, in the beginning of Zohar, it says that every letter came to Hashem and said, create the world with me. And he rejected every single letter. And the Zoya says what he told every letter. He starts with Tav, Shin. And then when it comes to Resh and Kuf, Hashem told them, I can't create the world with you because you are basically the letters that make up a lie. Sheker is Kuf and Resh, Elamai. A lie could never exist if there's not a little truth in it, right? Great lawyers, professional con artists, they'll always put in a little kernel of truth. So Hashem said, that's why you put in the Shin. Because the shin is really a letter of truth. And you put the shin into the kuf and the resh to make it sheker. So that way the sheker will have something to stand on. Because sheker ain't loy raglayim. Lies don't have feet. So a kuf doesn't have feet. And a resh doesn't have feet. It's shaky. Because lies never stand. Lies always, as they say, liars have to have good memories. Because you lie yesterday, you have to remember what you said. If you speak truth, you never have to have a good memory. In other words, if you're going to make a career out of lying, make sure... 
that you, you don't suffer from Alzheimer's. Make sure that you remember things. Because you always have to cover up the lie Sheker in Lairaglayim, because by, there's no it's not reality. It, it it never lives from itself. It lives from cover ups. MS Yesh Lairaglaim Shin is the most solid letter in the alphabet. It's it says it's it has th- it has a good foundation shin. So Sheker took the shin, Kuf Reish took the shin and put it in, so they should be able to stand. So he says Kuf and Reish are Asvin de Ziyufa. So you take the Kuf and Reish, which are Asvin de Ziyufa, and you transform them, Linyane Toivuk Dusha, that's the Karashim, to take the Shin and the Reish, to take the Kuf and the Reish, which took the Shin, and transform it into Karashim, into pillars of the Mishkan. This is a very, very brief summation of some of the ideas in the Maimer of Basilagani, which lead up to chapter 9 of the original Basilagani, which is now going to become the focus. Ah. Good question. You're saying Krashim are also, you're saying from your experience with construction, so this triggered you. So this is good for the Mishkan. How does this apply to regular beams? Right. Well, the guy who built this was a liar, basically. That's how it applies. (laughs) But you'll see. It's a good question. (laughs) Yeah. He's asking, where did you see in the actual Mishkan of the Beis Hamikdash this concept of transforming insanity? On the contrary, it was structured, it was orderly, everybody knew exactly what they're doing. There was a uniform, there was a time, there were positions for everything. There were, it was very, it was an organized place. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't a Psalm of Lava Malka. Huh? That's true. Yaakov planted the, the, the cedar trees uh, when he came to Egypt, and he told him to take it out of Mitzrayim. Yeah, uh, Shab Tanchuma. Yeah, that's how they had. Actually, says that's how they had it. But he's asking to avoid in the Beis Hamikdash itself. It's a good question, and the truth is that the two we'll see a little later about this. But the two main avoiders in the Beis Hamikdash shouldn't. Say, the biggest of Edmund's major was Carbonus, and the second one, which was daily, was Ketiris. Both very interesting things. One was offering animals or birds or, uh, or grain. A lot of them were min- min- minachas, which were not animals. They were uh, usually wheat. They would take wheat flour and, and offer it, burn, burn part of the flour or part of the matzah on the mezbeach, which was also a very interesting offering. And that happened constant with wine libations, etc., and then, of course, animal offerings. And then the second avayda, which was very interesting, was burning incense every day. Every single morning, every single afternoon, they had 11 herbs. We, we, we speak about it every morning. Tanur Rabban and Pitum Akhtarius Ketzad. 11 herbs that were placed on the altar in coal, where there were coals. And the, and the incense, the herbs would burn, and a huge smoke and aroma would go up. As we'll see a little later, both of those elements in the Beis Hamikdash, even though it was orderly, represented each in its own way this concept of transformation of shtus. It'll become, it'll become clearer later. But transforming shtus doesn't mean that the person is a wild, uh, is, is, is behaving in a radically wild way. In the Beis Hamikdash, on the contrary, it had to be very organized. Yeah. What looks organized can also be shtus dikdusha. And what looks disorganized is lavdavke shtus dikdusha. It's the... It's the it's the sincerity and the depth that is invested in the Avaida. What part of the person and how deep and how real and how transcendent and how beyond uh, comfort zones he goes. So we'll soon see. The, the, but these two Avaidas, the Beis Hamikdash, were very critical for this idea. Maimer continues and says, that's why... <coughs> The Krashim were called Aimdim. Kamay Shakasov, it says in Truma, Vasisis a Krashim le Mishkan, Atse Shittim Aimdim. The beams should be Atse Shittim Aimdim. So, what, what does it mean, Aimdim? Standing, it shouldn't be sitting? Uh, your beams don't sit, they stand. I mean, what's Prat Aimdim? Befayo, see, he says, Aimdim hu inyan amudim. 
Asvin the Dain, Ka Asvin the Dain. In the Sefer Torah, there's no Nekudas, which is why the Gemara often will explain every word in different possible pronunciations. Even though you have to read Oimdim, right? It's true. But since it's the same letters like Hamudim, so that itself represents that it's also a concept of Hamudim, which again means pillars, Hamudim. Yuma. The source of this is in Yuma, Dafayim Beis, Al Pasik Atsi Shittim Oimdim, the Oimdim Uinyan Mamidim. The Gemara says they what's that Atsi Shittim Oimdim. And one of the explanations in Gemara is Oimdim means Ma'amidim. They hold up, not they stand. It's a Dover Hamaimid. Maimid in Hebrew means something that is a found, it holds up. It's Maimid. What does it hold up? The Gemara says over there, Ma'amidim Tsipuya, that the the beams were plated with gold and they held up. They held up the gold that throughout all of the journeys it never decomposed. It never rotted. It never fell down. And another interpretation over there in Rashi is that they actually, they actually uh, connected them with nails. So the Krushim were not only standing, the Atsi Shittim were Ma'amidim. They also held up that which was covering them. Mavaya Bahamaimer. Once we already see in Gemara the connection between Oimdim and Amudim, and that's why Amudim are called Amudim, because they're Maimid. They hold up the structure, they hold up the building. So Amudim and Oimdim are connected because it's the same letters. And the Gemara explains this connection. So he says, The function of a pillar is to connect the roof and the ground and the floor to ultimately be one. And that's what turns it into a structure. And that's why pillars, we have quite a few construction people. So maybe they can explain this much better than I. Than I. But that's why pillars are so critical. Right, MS? And if you don't know what you're doing with the beams and the pillars, it's a brachel of atala, because this is not just a little mistake. This is essential to the structure. This is actually what turns it into an integrated. This is when the home becomes a home. Why? Because the gag and the ritzpa now suddenly became part of one structure. That's why he says the Krushim are called Oimdim, which are Mudim, not only because they were beams, literally, and that's also why they're called Oimdim, but it's also similar to the concept of mitzvahs, which are also called pillars. Mitzvahs are what connect infinity with the worlds. The beams, just like the mitzvahs, connect Ein Saif with the worlds. That's what he says in the Mimer. So Krashem are pillars. What does a pillar do? It connects the roof and the ground to become literally one. You walked into the house and the house includes the roof and the house includes the ritzpah and they're all part of one essential unit. So in this sense, Krashem are like mitzvahs. By mitzvahs it says they're the pillars that connect heaven and earth, godliness with the world, and the Krashem do the same. This is the Maimer. When it comes to explaining mitzvahs, the Bala Tanya the Alter Rebbe in Tanya Negeris HaKadosh Choftas explains, Asherot Zenel Yenikri B'Shem Keser. Hashem's will in Kabbalah is called Keser, the crown. In a famous prayer of the Tanner Ibn Nechunya Ben Akana, who was one of the great Kabbalists, he wrote a sefer called Sefer Haboyer. And in the Kabbalistic work Pardis, he quotes the Tfil of Ibn Nechunya Ben Akana. And there, in that prayer, Ibn Nechunya Ben Akana says, Asher Baha Keser Yashboi Tarach Amudei Oy. Keser, the crown, is made up of three letters, Chof. Reish, Sof, Keser, Chaf, Sof, Reish, which is Tarach, 620. Chaf is 20, Reish is 200, and Sof is 400. So 400 and 200 is 600, and Chaf is 20. So Rabbi Nechunya ben Akana says that the crown has 620 pillars of light. What does this mean? So the Tanya explains, the just like when you have a base chayma gadol. Base chayma gadol is what they would call a huge mansion that has a fortress, that has a wall all around it that's tall. 
So you have to have pillars. And the pillars stand on the ground. But the top of the pillars are connected to the roof and hold up the roof. And that's what creates the actual structure. Without the pillars, you would have either no roof or the roof would cave in and it wouldn't be able to be there. Kacha mitzvah says the time mitzvah, nitzavim mirayim hamaylis. They stand and they originate in the highest of levels, who rots in alien baruchu, which is called Hashem's will, which is keser, venim shachim ad ha'aretz. And they extend like the pillar all the way to the ground. Where do you see that? Shah mitzvah neslap shubagashmis. All mitzvahs are manifested, are expressed in material things. Even mitzvahs that don't assume a physical incarnation. Tefillin is not a question. You use the height of an animal. Tzitzis, you use wool. Mezuzah, again, you use parchment with the height of an animal or ink that comes from herbs. Tzedakah, you have to use physical money, minted. Or trumas and maestris, you have to have physical grain or physical produce, physical fruit, physical vegetables. You want to light a Hanukkah candle, you need the oil and you need the wick. It's all gashmis, every single mitzvah. But even those few mitzvahs that are not corporal, learning Torah, davening, benching, kriya shema, they were also given to a physical person who has a choice to go this way or that way. In other words, the entire arena of mitzvahs happen within the most physical reality. Either the mitzvahs themselves are very physical when it comes to eating Shabbos food or, or karbonis or any one of the other tayag mitzvahs, or even those few mitzvahs that are more spiritual in nature, who has to, who has to, who has to commit them, who has to perform them, a person who struggles, a person who has choices. So the Balatanya says, that's why mitzvahs are called amudim. Just like a pillar, a physical pillar, connects the roof to the earth, to the ground, that they become mamish one, so that you walk in, and the pillars on the earth, so it's part of earth, and it connects all the way to the roof, and it holds it up so it becomes a single structure. That's the function of mitzvahs. Mitzvahs originate where? In Ratz and Ha'elyon, it's called the crown, the keser. Keser is the Kabbalistic term for Hashem's innermost will. It has 620 pillars of light, because there are 613 biblical mitzvahs. And seven rabbinic mitzvahs. That's what Alter Rebbe explains. So that's why Rabbi Nechanya ben Akana said that Kesser has 620 pillars. Each mitzvah is another pillar that trans- brings down the light from the highest place, which is Hashem's inner will, but to where? To the lowest world, to the physical world. Every mitzvah accomplishes that. So when I do a mitzvah, I actually, I'm holding on to what? Hashem's actual will. But how? Through a very, very concrete physical act, or even if it's not a physical act, it's being done by a person who lives in a very physical place and has many choices to go this way or to go that way, and every mitzvah has to be a choice. So essentially, as he says in Tanya, the pillars are hollow, amudim are hollow, and in this sense, the amud of the mitzvah surrounds the soul. The soul goes into every mitzvah, because when you do a mitzvah, you, so to speak, go into the mitzvah, the mitzvah dresses you up, whether you're putting on tefillin or you're learning Torah, you're down, any mitzvah you're doing. So you get dressed in the mitzvah. In other words, you enter into this hollow pillar. This pillar surrounds your soul. You're inside the pillar. And as a result of that, your soul becomes connected through 620 passageways from the highest, highest place, Keser, which is Hashem's will, all the way down to the point that the two become one. Because this brings, the point is, you want to bring out how the mitzvahs connect, right? Like the Amud. They connect the highest Ratzin with what? With the lowest physical reality. So we're saying because all the mitzvahs, how do they capture God's will? It's not Hashem's will that relates to something completely divine and transcendent. The will is manifested in, in a very physical activity. So he adds, even those mitzvahs that are more spiritual by nature, Avas Hashem, Yiris Hashem Tefillah. So number one, even they have to be performed by a physical person. It's not a person living in heaven. It's not a soul or an angel. And to bring out even more, when you say it's being formed by a physical person, it's a person who often lives in tension and in struggle and constantly has to make choices. 
והנה, מדיוק לא שנה מיימר מובן שיש הפרש בין הקרושים למצווה. When you read the Maimer, Bossi Lagana, you see that it's not exactly the same. There's a difference between the beams of the Mishkan and the Mitzvahs. Tezel, Masha Kosov Ba Maimer, Sha Kroshem Heim Al Derech HaMitzvahs, Al Derech V'Dugma Levat. He says, Kroshem are similar. Sha Mitzvahs Heim Amudim Mamash, Va Kroshem Heim Al Derech HaMitzvahs. Al Derech means they're similar, but they're, it's not identical. The real Amudim are Mitzvahs, as the Tanya says. He Kroshem are compared to that. V'Lachem. And that's why Baha Mitzvah Suwaimir Haloshan Mam Shikhim Khabrim Sai Baruchu. Va Oilamas U Baha Krashim Ainu Yaimir Haloshan Mam Shikhim. Kim Shaim Khabrim Oirin Sai Baruchim Oilamas Al Dara Khamitzvas. When you look in the quote of the original Basil Lagani chapter nine of the Rebbe Ayats, which he quoted earlier in this chapter, when it comes to mitzvahs, the expression is Mam Shikhim U Mechabrim. They bring down and they connect the Ain Sai for the worlds. When it comes to Krashim, he deleted the word mamshichim. He just said, Why? Because mitzvahs are the real amodim. They bring it down and they connect. By krashim, he just uses the word mechabr. What then is the difference between krashim and mitzvahs? This is not stamap is a little, uh, he's trying to get very technical in his words, but this will convey the essence of the idea. Vihine, next issue, but Tanya Yesh Gamkin Hefresh bin Amashal Dam Mudim La Nimshal de Mitzvahs. If you look in Tanya, there's also something strange in how he puts it, how he defines the metaphor of pillars and the Nimshal of Mitzvahs. Quoted before in the last line of the previous page, see if you could see what technical detail the Rebbe is introducing here. The last two lines of page Yud, yeah, he says, there's a quote from Tanya, Yigaris HaKadosh Chavtas, Kemoshe HaShamudim HaBeis Chaim HaGadol, Nitzavim Ba'aretz V'Rosh HaMechuba B'Tikra, Kach HaMitzvah Nitzavim Meireim HaMailas V'Rotzim V'Nemshachim HaDaretz. You see the difference? The difference is very interesting. Uh, the direction. Being in HaMudim HaMer Shem Nitzavim Ba'aretz V'Rosh HaMechuba B'Tikra, Uba Nimshol De Mitzvah Soim Reim Nitzavim Beireim V'Nemshachim HaDaretz. When it comes to HaMudim, he starts with the earth. They stand on the ground, and the top connects to the roof. When it comes to mitzvahs, the order changes. It says, They stand on the highest level, the Ratzin, and they come down to the earth. Why did the Balatanya change the Moshal from the Nimshal? It's quite clear. When you're building a home, you begin... From the bottom. And then they grow and you they ascend, they reach the roof. When you're talking about mitzvahs, you're not dealing with a physical pillar in a physical house. It's the exact opposite. The mitzvah stands, the mitzvah begins where? Above. He sanctified us with his mitzvahs. Mitzvah yisav shalamayla. In other words, this is his. It's his will. It's his baby. And from there it comes down. That's why the Balatanya changes the order. This is consistent with the principle. In Sefer Apardis, in Kabbalah, It's a fundamental difference between foundations here, in our world, and foundations in the spiritual realm. Lamata ha yisoidu lamata va love nivna habinyan. O lamaila ha yisoidu lamaila me habinyan. In our world, the foundation is always on the, in the lowest place, on the bottom. You got to go under the earth to find the foundation. The example would be the tree. Where are the roots? The roots are below the earth, they're not invisible. And that's the most critical component. The same is true with a home. And the larger the home, just like the larger the tree, the deeper the roots, the wider the roots, because they need all the water to be able to sustain themselves. The same is true with a building, a mansion, a structure. You must have the foundation, and the foundation is invisible. You don't invite people into the foundation. That's not the place that you show off. It's lamat, it's always, and it's lo the lowest. In other words, it's never like, let's put the foundation on the second floor. <laughs> then you're not going to have a house. The foundation, you always have to go to the lowest, lowest point, and there you build the Yisoyed. That's the klal in this world. The Yisoyed is always Lamata, and on top of it is the Binyan. Lamaila, in the spiritual reality, it's the exact opposite. The Yisoyed is high, higher, and then from there comes the Binyan, the other way around. 
then the Gemara in Sanhedrin has an example, it has an expression. The neshama is the root, and the body is the trunk and the branch, right? The neshama is the root, and the body comes out of it, because Lamaila, we understand, when you speak in spiritual reality, the yesoid, the foundation means, the very basis of it is higher. What do we mean higher? Higher means closer to the source, reflecting the source more. And the lower you go, the more distant you have the structure. In our world, it's the exact opposite. The lower you go, that's where you have the foundation. And it, oh, the system changes. That's what the paradise says. <speaking in Hebrew> That's why the Tanya says, when it comes to pillars, where is the nitzavim? Where is the real strength? The foundation has to be powerful and mighty. The entire strength of a tree is based on the roots. The roots are not solid. A wind comes, a thunderstorm comes, and the tree goes, like it says in Prick of Where is the nitzavim? The shtarkite, nitzav melech, the Pasuk says, the king standards ba'aretz. And on top of it, you can have a structure. And as based on how strength of the foundation, that's how splendid and exquisite and elaborate can your structure be. And everybody knows when you try to cut corners when it comes to foundations, what happens? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Right? Certain things, you want to cut corners, people don't realize. Yeah? In the paint, they'll never cut corners because everybody sees it. Cosmetics. In the dining room chairs, they don't cut corners. Foundations, who cares? It's completely invisible. But that's where everything happens. That's lamata, or lamayla, or binyana mitzvahs, who I mishem nitzav and berem amaylas. But when it comes to mitzvahs, he's not going to say the mitzvahs are nitzav on earth and they connect to heaven. The yisoid of the mitzvahs, berem amaylas, in the keser, in the crown above. Lefisha lamayla, rechoizik v'yisoid ha-davar hu lamayla. Yisoid means the strength, the essence, the core, the nucleus, the foundation. That's what you say, this, the foundation of everything. When we talk about our world, where's the foundation? Always at the lowest point. You want the ultimate strength, you've got to go to the lowest, lowest point. And if you try to elevate it, you're destroying everything. So you come to the tree, you've got to go to the lowest point. When it comes, when you speak in the spiritual realm, you're looking for the foundation, you've got to go to the highest point. So by mitzvahs, he starts with the foundation. Where's the foundation? Up there. When he speaks about pillars, he starts with the foundation. Where's the foundation? Down here. But this itself is so strange. True, the physical world is not the spiritual world. But it's a continuum. There's an evolution or a devolution. So why does it change? That in this world, you want to go to the foundation, you have to go to the lowest place. And if you didn't reach the lowest place of the entire structure, you're not getting close to the foundation. That's where we look to create the foundation, and we learn this from nature itself. That's how the trees operate. They will figure out, right, how far and how deep, and if there's an opportunity, the tree will stretch, and if it's not getting enough water, will go lower and further in order to be able to make sure it's solid, and that's what it searches for. Why is it that the yisoid is transformed completely. So you'll say, well, where should we put the foundation of a house? On top of the house? I think in, uh, in Disney World or somewhere, I once saw, <laughs> you ever saw? They have the, huh? They have an upside down house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That also has a good foundation, yeah. Of course, he's not asking that we should build the Yisoyed Lamayla. We know that we have to build the Yisoyed Lamata. The question is, why did he reboin the Create the laws of engineering and science, and physics, and gravity, and mechanics, in such a fashion that the system changes, since in MS, the higher it is, the more foundational it is. That's the Yisoyed. The higher it is, the more Yisoydistic it is. Why in this world, in physicality, it translates into the opposite direction. And that is that the foundation will always be found at the lowest point. That's his question. Taka de Pardis says this is a difference. And you see how the Tanya reflects it in its choice of words when it speaks about physical pillars versus spiritual pillars. Amudim versus mitzvahs. But why do you have, the, in other words, the fact that it's physical, I understand it's physical. 
But everything in the physical world is a mirror, it's a reflection. Besides in this Nakuda, when you're looking for the foundation, don't go to the top, go to the bottom. For you, von Zal, Piamavur, ah? What? That's not a mirror. It should be, it should, in the physical world itself, it should be higher. It should be Lamaila, not Lamata. Why? If I can't. I didn't mean a mirror in that sense. A mirror I meant a continuum. I didn't mean the word mirror. The 620 pillars represented by the 620 mitzvahs. And each mitzvah brings forth the innermost will of Hashem into this world. Meaning when we grab, when we fulfill mitzvah, we are accessing, we are connecting, we are aligning ourselves, and we are implementing, and we are holding on to God's will. So the mitzvah, it, the mitzvah is the amud that links the highest space to the lowest space. That's the mitzvah. Isn't there an idea that the lower, the deeper the work gets, that's where you get highest? Okay, that's already a sneak preview. <laughs> In the mind. Oh, oh, so, and that's Taka, that's Taka what we mean by the higher world. You're right. <laughs> that's the Ruchni and the Gashmi. You know, you're right. It's very good. You're, incre- you're, you're, you're increasing the question. Because we take a see in a house, there's the physical foundation. But what's the, before the physical foundation? What's the real foundation of a house? I don't mean real as in concrete. Concrete as in concrete and concrete. I mean the real foundation as the, the, the spiritual foundation of a house, right? It's your imagination. It's your, your hasogis. It's your, ah? Huh? Uh, who pays the bill, so it depends, depends on his asagas, depends on the asagas, it depends his sensitivity to architecture, to art, right? people imagine, they imagine mansions and buildings and structures and companies and organizations, right? And that's real, if you don't have that, Ken's boyin and boyin and boyin, we all know, uh, here are very prominent construction workers, the nightmare of people who thought they had a dream, and then you build them the house, and they said, I never wanted this, I never knew this. The more you know what you want inside, the more you can actually implement it. So actually here we see, right, that the ultimate you said, when it comes to the spiritual house, is based on what? On, on, on deeper vision, on deeper wisdom. The you said is, lamaila. <laughs> the higher you go, the more, that's what you mean? Is that what, that's what you meant? And when it comes to the physical it becomes topsy turvy. For Yuvens al Piamavur become Yanim. The explanation is based on a similar theme that you will find in many different themes in Yiddishka. Now, this is not just this is one example of a theme that is prevalent. Umehem, one of the places where this is explained is Be'inyan Yesh Hanivra. When it comes to the Yesh Hanivra, Yesh Hanivra means the ego of the existent. Of the of the of the creature who exists. I'm going to read it. This is this is a loaded a loaded sentence. Then we'll translate. The The reason that in the consciousness of every existent being in this world, he has no antidote antecedent. He doesn't have a cause, an ila, a siba that precedes him in his own consciousness. He has no source. He has no antecedent. He doesn't come from anywhere. He doesn't feel that there's anything above him. And he says, heaven forbid, because there is something above him. But he doesn't feel that he needs to justify his existence to anybody or anything. No, the Rebbe is saying chas right. uh, No, no. In other words, the fact the fact that in my feeling, 
I don't feel that I have to justify a meaning or a purpose because I don't have anything that preceded me. I'm here, as far as I'm concerned, I'm here forever and I'll be here forever. And if you'll interview the rock, the rock will tell you the same thing. In other words, it's, what's the class of shalom? Is it a sarcastic statement? It's like atheism. Oh, the number is the thought. Yeah, 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 the thought, yeah. So who is? So you'll say, why? Why do we have it? We have it because that's, that's what this world is like. That, that's, that's a world of atheism. That's not the real reason. real reason is, the fish is havusa yumeha atzmus. Mom is the opposite. And this is a chiddish of the Balatanya, the Alter Rebbe, that he wrote literally a day or two before his Istalkos. Printed in Igeris HaKadosh Tanya Simen Chaf, which he wrote the last few days in a little town called Piena, where he escaped to from Napoleon and he remained there and he fell ill over there and he passed away. Metzoy Shabbos, Parsha Shmois, Chavdal Atev, Estav Kofay and Gemo. 1812. And in there he wrote the letter, Simen Chaf, it's one of the longest, if not the longest chapter of Tanya, Vigar Sakaidish. And over there he introduces an insight that he never shared throughout his life at least not in the visible writings that we have, a few days before his passing, it was like, it was like a tzavo. And over there he brings out a fascinating point. It begins like a logical question, but it evolves into something much more. And the question that he raises over there, I'm going to say it briefly and concisely, so try to tune in, because it's a very, very intense idea. The question he raises is, we have a basic principle, I can only give you something that I have. Something that I don't have, I can't give you. I can't teach information that I don't have. I can't give you money that I don't have. We, we give what we have inside of us. Because if I don't have it inside of me, how can I give it to you? Our physical world evolves from spiritual energy, from divine spiritual energy, from ruchnes. Bereshis bar lekimas hashmaim vesaretz. Kabbalistically, spiritually, there's a whole system of ishtalshalus, of spiritual evolution, where the divine energy descends step after step after step, and it assumes a lower incarnation and a lower incarnation until it assumes a physical incarnation of mamoshes. It's concretized in a substantial way. This is what we call ishtalshalus. We're learning about this in morning, a shiurim of a yadaita, Moskva, Tafresh, and Zion at length, how every level is a mushal for the higher level, and then you go down and down and down and down. Like a teacher, basically, who has this profound idea, and he can't give it to his students because nobody will understand it. So what does the teacher do? He compresses it, he restricts it, he gives a story, and then the story has another story to explain it, and that's called, and the idea evolves until it becomes a tangible idea that the, teacher, that the student says, ah, I got it. And that's what Elam Haz is. Granted, but Alter Rebbe says, I have a question. This world has one characteristic that nobody else has. No other world has it. No other creature has it. There's many, many worlds. There are in, in Kabbalah, there are infinite worlds. Besides the basic worlds, Atzilus, Bri, Yitzir, Asir, there are infinite states of consciousness. But they all have one common denominator. And that is, they know that they have a father and a mother. <laughs> they come from somewhere. Somebody chose them. There's meaning to my life. Yeah? What do we say? Birth is God saying, you matter. You matter. Why do you matter? Because I chose. You, 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 you mean something. You're not just a, a random mutation. You're not just a random error. There's meaning to your life. And, and if there's meaning to your life, you want to look for that meaning. What is one of the greatest uh, motivations of atheists today? To go on Messiris Nefesh and defy all the proofs to say that there's no God. As, as I once told somebody, you need much more faith today to be an atheist than you need to believe that God exists. Because, because to be an atheist today, you have to say that the incredible organization and structure of the universe happened over 15.3 billion years randomly. It would basically be like saying a blind man takes the, what is it called, the kids play... Rubik's Cube, a blind man takes the Rubik's Cube, and over 90 years, yeah, he manages to do it, right? And he gets every single one right every single time over 90 years, and it, it could happen statistically, yeah? But what are the chances? So you have to explain it, you have to have much more faith than saying, you know what? Somebody did it for him, <laughs> or somebody told him what to do. There was an intelligent designer. So, but why are people so motivated to this? Very simple. 
The moment you say that there is a cause, then you have to also ask one more question. Maybe there's a purpose. Maybe there's meaning. That means maybe there's responsibility, not only, not only a statue of liberty, but there's also a statue of responsibility. My life has to answer a question. My life is here to answer a question. Ayeko. Yeah, Hashem tells Adam, Ayeko, Vubistu. After the Eitz he's not sure. He's not sure. In other words, this world has a quality that no other world has. Everyone exists. Every other consciousness exists with one element. There's an ilah v'siba. There's somebody who wanted me here. There's something that precedes me. There's something that chose me. Not in this world. In this world, yes, Stephen Hawking just died. He's considered the greatest genius of our time. And the headlines after his death was that he died declaring that from all his knowledge, he's still an atheist. And not only are you a respected person, you could be one of the most respected people of a generation. This is a unique quality that only our world has. There was a very famous atheist, his name was Bertrand Russell. He's a professor in Cambridge University. And they, they asked him, what will happen if you die and you come up there and you see that there's a God? What are you going to do? Because his whole life he fought it. He said, I'll tell him you didn't provide the evidence. <laughs> that's a, you didn't provide the evidence this is a quality in this world you, you can't prove God in the laboratory you could debate and argue and show ultimately it's a choice it's a choice this where did our world get this from where did our world get this from where did our world get this quality everything ultimately is a manifestation I understand there's symptom and there's helim and there's concealment. The world ultimately comes from a spiritual core. The spiritual core is a complete reflection of the divine. His answer for this is, his answer is quite counterintuitive. And that is that there's also one more being that has the same experience. Who? <laughs> Hashem. Hashem also doesn't have a cause. He also doesn't have an antecedent. Huh? That's why he's God, right? Who created God? The answer is, he didn't have to be created. It's, it's essence, it's truth. It's beyond space, time, and matter. All other worlds are created, they're brought into being by divine light, by divine energy. Because they're brought in by divine energy, divine light feels that it has a source. So it gives the world a feeling that it has a source. Our world is a direct product from Hashem's essence. And because Hashem's essence has no source, so our world experiences itself like Hashem's essence, as something essential that it has no source. Even though it has a source, but the fact that we don't feel we have a source is the greatest divine quality of our world. In other words, what seems like the cursed ego, which is this root of all arrogance, is really the most spiritual quality and characteristic of our universe in which our world embodies the pure, pure essence that really doesn't have a source. So the healing of our world is not by obliterating the ego, it's by aligning the ego with its true ultimate its true ultimate core. Ego stands for easing God out, but that's the hollow perception of the ego. The real sense of the selfhood of the universe is rooted in the fact that you're actually expressing the purest essence, which doesn't have a source. So even though the way I experience it is, as an egotistical reality that is completely divorced of God. That's my perception of it. But in its ultimate truth, this very notion of separateness is really the greatest connection to the ultimate self. So where you find the ultimate truth is in the ultimate self. So when, when you're dealing in the spiritual worlds, the spiritual worlds all come from divine light. Light has a source. If, if, if the light of the sun comes into my house and I shut the, the blinds, the light is not going to stay in the house. Why? 
Because light says, no, 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 don't worship me. <laughs> I come from the sun. There's not going to be a separation. You, you create a mechitza between me and the sun. There's no light anymore. Like in Chelem, you know, they had to be Mekadosh de Levona, and they couldn't find the moon. So they hired a shimer that when the moon shows up in the middle of the night and it's reflected in the barrel of water, yeah, he should put a lid, close the lid, and trap the moon. And he did that, and the next more day they all came to do Kiddush Levona, and they opened the barrel... The moon is gone, and Ada they're looking for the Ganav. They're looking for the thief. Who stole the moon? Chelem, and there's different versions and stories who they caught, and they're still looking. And in different communities, they have discovered various thieves of that moon. Or you can't separate from the source. Because all of the spiritual worlds come from divine light, divine light reflects the source, so that's what it gives to the student. But our world is rooted in atzmus, in the essence. So what does it give our world? What it has, what does it have? Absolute self-sufficiency. That to the core of identity is the divine. The deepest, deepest core of what we call yesh, which is l'cha'ayda, the greatest enemy to religious consciousness, which is why most religions try to fight the ego, obliterate the ego, destroy the ego, right? Destroy self-esteem, huh? You got to start from scratch, yeah. Yeah, you want to tell them where you grew up? You don't have to. So, uh, right? So we want to destroy the ego. The famous words in Yiddish, du bist a garnished. Yeah, how many times did you hear that? Du bist a garnished. That's supposed to be a religious sentiment. You're nothing. And, and the more you feel that nothingness, the more spiritually sensitive you are, Right? That exists in, within a certain spiritual consciousness. But in the ultimate equation, what Alter Rebbe revealed Mamish before he was leaving this world is that it's actually the other way around. It's that experience of separateness. Ein lo ila v'siba. I got nothing. I got nothing on me. I have nothing on me. We don't even feel that we have parents. We know that we have parents. We don't feel that we have parents. In my consciousness, I don't feel that my mother justifies my existence. And if I do, I go to therapy for that. <laughs> if mommy is too much in control, you go to therapy. But he's in therapy. Most Jewish kids are in therapy because of the mother. Like, separate me from my mother. What do you mean separate you from your mother? You are your mother, for heaven's sake. Ask your mother, she'll tell you. <laughs> we don't have a natural instinct I'm my father's boy. I know that I'm my father's boy. But in my Hergish, I don't. Certainly God. I don't even know that. That Nekuda, which seems like the shame of our world. It's why everybody said this world is filthy. This world is contaminated. This world is, is a stupid prusdor. It's a corridor. It's like the airport. It's JF, this world is JFK airport. Who, who sets up a tent in JFK airport and says, you have a cheer in JFK? You, you lament the hours that you have to spend in JFK waiting for the plane. This world is basically an airport. It's a prusdor. It's a filthy place. It's a place of taivas, of nesioinus, of meshagasen. The real world is where you know that God exists. That's the real world. This is just a waste of time. You got to do it because you have to show receipts from this world and then they let you into that world. That's one perception. Is there truth to it? Of course there's truth to it. That's one side of the world. Came down to them and said there's another side of the world. And that is if you can only put on the right lenses, you can realize that the very sense of selfhood in its deepest core, which is the greatest enemy for Ruchnius and Yiddishkeit and spirituality and faith. But if you can align it with what it really is, it actually becomes the embodiment of the truest core of God. That real sense of self-sufficiency is not your detachment from God. It's your ultimate attachment where your very self is a representation of the ultimate truth that doesn't have a source, that doesn't have an antecedent, that doesn't have an originator, a progenitor to say, that is why you're here. In that very, very core of I, you could find the core of the divine I. The Hesheb Nuchem. Ah. No, no, this is not the Ruchnius that you possess. This is a whole other Chiddush. You have the fact that there's a Neshama, and there's Ruchnius, and there's a Muna. That's the higher world that exists in you. Because even in this world we have the higher world, right? That's the Atzillus in you, the Bria you. Here we're saying Anuvart. In the Tachten. In the, in the lowliness. 
in the place where you feel nothing, where you're like, I'm just I, and I'm good. <laughs> it's I. I am about I. That's it I'm about. If you can interview this big boulder outside and say, what justifies your existence? Excuse me, what justifies your existence? And if the Tzach Tzach they give a frask, you'll remember me. The, 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 the stone doesn't need any justification. Why are you here? Why, why are you here? What do you mean? Why, why am I not here? As far as I'm concerned, I was always here. I will always be here. That's, that's my feeling. That's my essential feeling. Where does that come from? <laughs> so you say, well, that's human, human arrogance. It could become human arrogance. It could become human narcissism. It could become human destructiveness. That's true. That's where Pchira comes in. But what is its ultimate truth? Its ultimate truth is that, uh, that it's, 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 it's the manifestation of Atzmos. That's what he's saying in these, these few lines. This is an essay that the Baal HaTanya wrote approximately two or three days before he returned his soul to its maker in the month of December 1812, in a little, little hick town called Piena in the Ukraine. It's printed in the fourth section of Tanya, chapter 20, one of the very profound and cryptic, very profound essays. And this is three or four lines from the essay. This is not the whole essay. This is literally three or four lines from that essay, which he quotes here. Let's see the words. The Ze- uh? So Hashem is most reflected in the Ooh. attitude of completely denying him more than anything else. Ah. Yeah. So, of course, you have to be careful with this idea, right? Like all of these ideas. These are very, uh, let's put it, very mature ideas, beyond mature. They're, 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 he's revealing serious, serious secrets. These are not secrets that were ever revealed. These are serious secrets. They revolutionize, uh, they revolutionize uh, uh, much... Uh, much of Jewish thought, one of the great revolutions is uh, service of God ultimately is not about obliteration of ego. Service of God is actually the deepest form of self-assertion, of self-actualization. It's just realizing what self-assertion really means, what that self is. You don't have to meet God. In this sense, you are you are, you're not a reflection. If you were a reflection, you would feel like a reflection. But you're not a reflection. You're essence. So that's why you don't feel like a reflection. How could you feel like a reflection when you're essence? Feeling like a reflection is a much lower part in you. Your spirituality is actually a lower part. Because spirituality, you feel like a reflection. You're the ray of the sun. But what about if you're the sun itself? What about if you're the sun itself? This is it. This is it. This, this core is the divine itself. So it's much higher. It's much higher than reflection. This is what real self-assertion is. But that could also be atheism. It's two sides of the same coin. It's two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Atheism... That same yeah. realization. Yeah. Atheism is stripping the self from its grandeur. Atheism, right, is taking the self and reducing it into a very small creature that is a mistake. <laughs> it's taking that self and turning it into just a random, a random error that happened to be lucky and end up in a pretty cool cosmos with uh, 37 trillion cells floating around in your body with uh, your blood traveling uh, 12,000 miles a day uh, from the U.S. coast to coast three times. It's all just random mistakes. You know, you know what I mean? So, so you're just the lucky guy. I mean, you and me and another, another couple of billion uh, uh, lucky mistakes. So that you take that self, you take that self and, and you reduce it to a very meaningless blimp on the, a, an infinitesimal blimp on an, an endless universe, which is a mistake that evolved from a prebiotic uh, soup, as they call it, or cholent, whatever. Uh, primordial soup, thank you. Primordial soup, but it's the other. It's the other. It's the other side of it. So therefore, 
I, I, want, I want to just conclude this idea, and then we'll uh, take a break. <laughs> the reason that in his consciousness he has no antecedent, those are the words, because its emergence is from the core itself. Atzmos means Hashem's essence, not Hashem's radiance, not Hashem's reflection. Hashem mitzi'usoi me'atzmusoi. His mitzi'us comes from his atzmus. My mitzi'us doesn't come from my atzmus. My mitzi'us comes from an egg and a seed that come from my father and my mother tzalangayar, which comes from an antecedent, just like every tree comes from the apple tree, comes from the seed of the apple tree, which comes from the previous apple, which comes from the previous tree, which comes from the previous apple, in the great miracle of development of living organisms over thousands and thousands of years, which is incredible. And everything has an ila and a seba, and that's how you trace things back. Everything has an antecedent, a father, a progenitor, further, 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 further. My DNA evolved from somewhere. My genetic makeup, there's an inheritance. There's a Yerusha, there's a Hishtalshalus. That's the system of life. We all know that. Spiritually, it all comes from, that's the spiritual system of life. There's always an ila v'siba, and you look at that, and that gives you reference, it gives you context, it gives you a background, it gives you meaning, it gives you purpose. In our world, suddenly, Aniva Afsiyoid, Mitsiyusi, where do I come from? I come from me. My eye is the source of my eye. My eye is what precedes my eye. My eye doesn't have a precedent. My eye doesn't have an introduction. I don't need a hagdame to my eye. Ich bin ich, that's it. Where did we get such a breitkeit from? Where, where did this, uh, where did this uh, audacity come from? Where did it come from? So most say, th- we dismiss it. This is, this is the corruption of mankind. Yeah. And Alter Rebbe said, the corruption of mankind. This is atzmos. <laughs> this, is the, this is the ultimate truth, which can be distorted. Which can be very, very distorted. But it's... it's in, in its true ashkafa, if you get it, this is where it really is. This is not a reflection. This is a world of essence. So you, you could say that about a person. You know, you've answered to the person. How can you say it about a rock? Oh, the rocks really feel it. They don't have. They don't even have these issues of self doubt. They they. But they don't have any feeling of self. The the, the yesha gashmi. This is what the gashmi says. That the, this is what gashmi says. Ruchni is never does this. Ruchnius always says, I'm, I'm, I'm a reflection. Gashmi says, I, I don't reflect anything. I don't have to. I'm not obligated to reflect. So therefore, again, chas v'shalom. Here the chas v'shalom is different. And he has no cause that precedes him, heaven forbid. God wasn't created by God. By another God. Only Atmos can bring into the world a yesh, an ego, something may iron from absolute nothingness. It feels it has no precedent, nothing has to introduce me. My yesh is justified from myself. This comes from Atmos. That's what Mashiach means. Probably the best definition for the Messianic world. The time when the truth and the core of everything will be transparent. That's the definition of Mashiach. Mashiach is not some you know, Harry Potter world that's going to descend on our planet. Mashiach means that the MS will just be apparent. People who are in touch with MS now live in a world of Mashiach. They live in a world of Geula. Because the MS, it's that the MS will be revealed. Whatever is MS, the truth of everything will be revealed. It's going to be out there. There won't be a distortion. It's, not the world is going to be changed and altered. What Mashiach means is the Yesha Nivra will be speak the Yesha Amiti. Yesha Nivra means the ego of the creator, of the creation. Yesha Amiti means the real Yesh, the authentic Yesh, the authentic existence. What's the Shoirish of the Yesha Nivra? 
the Yesh Amiti. That's what it is. You are the Yesh Amiti. So what's the Tikkun of the world? Not obliterating the Yesh. Aligning the Yesh with the true Yesh. Because that's what it is. That's what it really is. That sense of that, that itness, that it, this, you're not a reflection, this is essence itself. Now that you say it, we are into Mashiach. Huh? Now that you just say it. They're saying and there's experiencing. So at some level. We... This type of self confidence doesn't lead to Napoleonic, uh, narcissistic personality disorder. This is the exact opposite. <coughs> huh? Okay. So now let's, let's just conclude this idea. Now we'll get it. So now you understand what's happening. That's why the Sefer Yitzhir says, the beginning is etched in the end. The beginning of everything, which is the essence, you could find in the end of everything, which is the physical yesh, which is the lowest. The world that becomes the home for God's essence is this world. This is going to come out when Mashiach comes in a transparent way. But here are the keywords. But the reason it's going to come out then is because that's what's that's the truth now. The future is simply a revelation of truth. But that truth is the truth right now about, about the yesh. That's why in this physical world it becomes topsy-turvy and the foundation, the strongest core, where you're going to find it? You've got to go to the lowest place. Over there you'll find it. In the higher world, the system changes. The higher you are, meaning the closer you are to the source, the more developed your consciousness is, the more selfless it is, the more it senses a higher truth, the more powerful it is, the more it's a foundation for a lower truth. On the contrary, the higher you go, the more closer you get to core, to foundation. Why? Because the system of the higher worlds is one of subservience in the lowest world is the exact opposite the lower you the lower you go the more the yesh the more you're getting to the etzem because the truth of the yesh is Hashem's atzmos so the more you get to the yesh the more yeshes the more detachment the more attachment now what do you do with this information Ah. So the whole system changes from the Maila to the Mata. What about if with, uh, with everything they taught you your whole life? Overall, yeah, but overarching, you know, consider it itself, Bittal, yes, Bittal, you see it. How about Bittal? It's not about it. What do we do with it? This is a real Bittal. When you realize, we don't have This is the greatest Bittal. <laughs> This is the greatest bittel. Bittel hayesh means you're fighting with somebody. The yesh says, I'm a yesh, and you're busy fighting. There's tension. There's no oneness. This is the greatest bittel. You should dismiss it. It's not a yesh anymore because the yesh... The, the yesh itself is bottle. The bittel is now not in competition with the yesh. There's no conflict. God wants and I want. That conflict is a product of concealment. This is the ultimate bittel. Bittel hayesh actually means there's a tension. So I'm a vatal the yesh. I have to subdue the yesh, confront the yesh, fight the yesh, battle the yesh, transform the yesh, elevate the yesh, whatever, discipline the yesh, teach it a lesson, smack it up. There is no yesh, there is no bittel. <laughs> Okay, that's the mile of Bittel Hayesh. That, that, that there is, you know, there's avoided, there's work, there's creativity. There's a Ratzin Ashoiv and so forth. What's the ultimate Bittel Hayesh? The ultimate Bittel Hayesh is I'm not fighting the Yesh. 
when I realize that the yesh is the ultimate source of bittel. Bittel can actually learn from the yesh. What do they say? Bittel can tear off a page from the chapter of the yesh. Bittel could learn from the yesh. The yesh teaches bittel what bittel is. Ah, now you want to know what it means also. It's when you realize that that which is the source of all selfishness in its truest sense is the source of all bittal. That which is the source of all evil, of all destructiveness, of all separateness, of the detachment of the, of the, of the ego, the ego, which is the source of, of, of all conflict, Conflict with yourself, besides conflict with your wife and everybody else, right? What's the source of all conflict? What's the source of all conflict? Stubbornness, ego, selfishness. I can't hear another opinion, I can't see another opinion, I can't compromise. Power, I need power, I need control, whatever it is. I have to be everywhere. I don't know, what, are you, what, what is the source of conflict in your life? Selfishness, what? It's your idea. ideas. Which is right? What's right? Is this right? Is that right? How does this work with that? That's true. That's another form of conflict. Huh? Like let's let's change your mind. Yeah, yeah. That's Lashem Shemayim, yeah. But what made it Lashem Shemayim is that there was no ego involved. They were looking for truth. There was a bitl there. So what could be, what, what is, what is on one level the source of so much uh, divisiveness and fragmentation in its ultimate core is the source of ultimate oneness, of ultimate bittal, without any tension at all in the most peaceful and holistic fashion because that core, core self that you're trying to protect that you're trying to protect, that you're trying to desperately, desperately hold on to. It can only be a concept. I mean, it says loss of love is... Yizgala. Yizgala. But now it's, uh, we can talk about it. The concept of... Yeah, but the, anything that's going to be in the Yizgala, La'asid love is the Pshat that does is the Emes. La'asid love is a creation from today. La'asid love is a reflection of today. So he's saying here. Ha'emes kein huya. Okay, we have what to think about. Or to experience, and will Be'ezer Hashem continue to explore this? Right. So, yeah, so. When you're talking about the yesh, the way it's experienced in this world, then the yesh is a contradiction to our discussion. So if you said bit like yesh, the question is how much bit like yesh there is. In the ultimate, the ultimate healing of the world, so that's a phase, but in the ultimate healing of the world, it's the opposite. The ultimate healing of the world is to be in the galaxy, there's no tension. That the yesh itself, which is the greatest opposition of the Hashem, that is the greatest connection with him. As he says, the yesh hanivra, that is the yesh. Can the two be detached? Of course the two can be detached. That's the story of this world. That's why he speaks bitl yesh, work with the yesh. And, and the truth is, if you don't have the first stage, you're not going to get to the second stage. You can't jump to the second stage without the first stage. Because... You're not going to get there. You don't get it. Yeah. You don't get it. Then you're just worshiping. Okay. You're worshiping your ego. It becomes just very self-centered. After the first stage, you go the, to the deeper place. So the first step of Abayi Yisrael, right, is the step where there's the, the bitul hayash. There's a certain competition with the yash. The work with it, can convince it, or fight with it. Every person from Shulchan. And the ultimate in his, in his, his interpretation of the yesh. And his, very good, in his interpretation of the yesh. Right. 
In the ultimate sense, though, you're 100% right. The yes itself, not only it's not a contradiction, not only do we make peace with it, not only do we let it be, but that becomes the greatest source of Kedusha. That becomes the, the greatest relationship. In fact, it's not a relationship. It is. It is. That's the word. It's not a relationship anymore. It's for the tshuva that the, that the tzaddik can do. As you said, it's the, your interpretation of the yesh needs tshuva. Even by a tzaddik, he also could have an interpretation. Relative. Again, relative. everything is relative. What the, very, it's very subtle. It's very very sarcastic. Sarcastic. Yeah. Of course, so like, like his tshuva b'chlal. And the ultimate tikkun is complete achdos, this complete unity. And there's Hashem and there's the world, and there's Hashem and there's the Guf, there's Ruchnes and there's Gashmis. And the Guf itself, and the Yesh itself, the Gashmi itself, it, uh, becomes, because it is, the greatest source of greatness, of, of, of Achdos, of Oneness. So it's a big thing, Megal. Huh? It is bitter. Once it's revealed, it's made. It's, it's bad, some bottle. It, it's the greatest form of bitter. And, and, and you don't have to be at Mavatl. It is bottle, A, and B, and this is even bigger. It's bitter is not through being Mavatl. It. It's bitter by it being it. <laughs> you understand? The bitl of the yesh is not through being mevatl. In the first phase, the bitl of the yesh is being mevatl. Negating it. Here, fakert. If you negate it, it's not good. The bitl of the yesh is in its yesh, it's not in its bitl. The yesh of it is the bottle. That, that's where the bitl is. The bitl is in the yesh. The yesh of it is the yesh. Not the bitl of the yesh on every yesh amiti. The yesh of the yesh on every yesh amiti. When you can see the shaylish. At this point, it's not really yesh. In of the course. way we, in the way we understand, of course, of course, it's yesh amiti, it's hashem. And this is probably the reason why we say there's yesh amiti and yesh nivra as opposed to yesh shikri. You had a good point. When yeah, you learn yesh ma'ain machloket between mail and matter, we say yesh amiti. We never call it yesh shikri. Right. Very good. Because yeah, it's, 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 it's not yesh shikri. It's yesh nivra. And the reason it's called Yesha Nivra is because it's the way the Yeshus comes into the Nivra. Right? Versus Yesha Miti is the way the Yeshus is in Emes. When the Emes is Nizgala to the Nivra, so the Yesha Nivra is the Yesha Miti. And that's the ultimate unity and the Tikkun of the whole world. Because the ultimate Tikkun is not in negating the world and negating the Yesh. It's in the Yesh being the Yesh that it's, that it's ultimately bottled. On another question. Okay. Based on that, then the, the, there's no chiluk between mitzad that. There's no Torah mitzvahs yidden goyim. So all gashmi is the same. It's all yes. Whereas in the time question, one end forms the other. So that's the way I see yeah, it. But the ratios between Torah, between Yisrael, the rest is just. Is not the purpose. Well, the Medrash right. says, Nesava Kaddish Baruch Ali is like Dira B'tachtoinim. Right? That he brings, he wanted to have a Dira B'tachtoinim. Why B'tachtoinim Dafka? So what B'tachtoinim? B'tachtoinim is the whole world, the right. whole physical world. Right? So, so, yeah. than, than and what's a Dira? Dira means a Dira where his essence lives. That Dira is accomplished through Torah and Yisrael. It's like he said about the mitzvahs, the mitzvahs are the Amudim, the pillars that created Dira down here, the Torah and the Mitzvahs, through Neshama Sisra. Mm -hmm. But theoretically, once Mashiach comes and once it's become Nizgala, so at that point, then, then that means the Torah and Yidin don't have the same, are on the same plane as everything else, in theory, in theory. It's not like that. Torah and Yisrael, don't worry. The Torah and Yisrael will have... Uh, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> but there'll be an akuda of Emes in every Yesh. In every Yesh. You see, it's the beginning of a Sugya. The stuff from... Uh, Shalom itself is Hashem, right? No. Shalom, it's like you're removing Hashem. Taking Hashem out of the picture. Says, yeah. Right, which makes sense if you say there's nothing but me, chas v'shal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.